Okay. Good evening, everybody. Hey, everybody. My name is, hold on a second. My name is Sandra Brett. I'm the director of the Charleston Jewish Film Fest. And a very warm welcome to tonight's program featuring the film, Love It Was Not. Our film and discussion tonight are a joint effort between the Charleston Jewish Film Fest, which is under the umbrella of the College of Charleston, Yastrzyk Arnold Jewish Studies Program, with generous funding from the Charleston JCC Foundation and the Stanley Farbstein Endowment, the Charleston Jewish Federation Remember Program, and the Charleston County Public Library. Many thanks to my co-host from the Remember Program, Aaron Boynton, all of you who are joining us tonight, and a very special thanks to our guest speakers, Dr. Olga Mincer and Dr. Sudi Back. As always, we welcome your questions and comments in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. A few items before we get to the movie discussion tonight. In the chat, you can see the info on our next Film Fest program. You can rent Schindler, Schindler's List on most streaming platforms and then attend our inaugural Jewish Film Club program on June 10th at 7 p.m. It'll be organized like a book club discussion and led by Scott Ospelmeyer, who is the executive director of the South Carolina Council on the Holocaust. Does Schindler's List film resonate after 28 years? We'll join our conversation on June 10th. And if you'd like to help choose future film club movies or you have a movie suggestion, please let me know. And next, a public service announcement as we commemorate those who were murdered in the Holocaust. History does not provide easy answers to the origins of hate and despicable acts still surround us. What can we do to actively address hate this Yom HaShoah? A hate crimes bill, which would provide additional penalties for crimes motivated by hate has just passed the South Carolina House of Representatives by a vote of 79 to 29. That's hot off the press. It would not have passed without the very hard work of many individuals and organizations, including our own local Jewish Community Relations Council. But there is much more work to be done to get this bill passed in South Carolina, because now the challenge will be for the bill to pass in the Senate. So after our program, please, please, please think about those who perished in the Holocaust. Go to stampouthate.sc, sign up, learn about this important bill, use the take action tool to let your state senator know that you support the bill, and please email me if you have any further questions about that. So now on to the movie. Love It Is Not was not an easy film to watch. There were no heroes, no righteous Gentiles to make us feel better. There were no cute child actors who were successfully evading the Nazis. I was personally intrigued by this movie because the experiences of those interviewed were so different than those of my Holocaust survivor parents. On Yom HaShoah, we also remember that every survivor had a very different experience. As we attempt to understand Love It Is Not, and Kim, can you go to the slide, please? It might help to revisit the slide of the Nazis after World War II. It would have been impossible, of course, to, pair, to prosecute all of those who collaborated with the, um, who collaborated with the Nazis, sorry, who collaborated with the Nazis after World War II. In the Netherlands alone, for example, it's estimated that 5% of the population were collaborators. That comes out to 500,000 people. And we're not talking about uh, Romania or Germany, we're talking about the Netherlands. So you couldn't possibly prosecute all of those collaborators. The world courts tried tens of thousands of perpetrators and coll collaborators, sensing approximately 100,000 Germans and Austrians. Most Nazis were not ultimately prosecuted, but these trials set lasting legal precedents and helped to establish the principle that crimes against humanity should not go unpublished, should not go unpunished. Next slide, please. The percentage of Austrians that were active in the Nazi killing machine was disproportionately large. 70 percent, but only a small number were brought to trial after 1945. By early 1948, the Austrian people's courts had charged 108,000 people under the war crimes law. More than 28,000 people were brought to trial and over 13,000 were sentenced. Sentences of more than 10 years were imposed on only 350 defendants. 30 death sentences were actually executed. However, the majority of those that were convicted were pardoned in the 1950s in Austria. In 1957 in Austria, there was a general Nazi amnesty. And by then, many former Nazis had already been integrated into the Austrian political system. So we get a bit of an understanding on, on where Franz was in this system. Perhaps you saw the article in yesterday's New York Times, which relates how Franz Huber, 
that Hitler's secret police in Austria and then was recruited to spy for the West during the Cold War. Soon, no one discussed these Nazi war trials and between 1955 and 1975, only 39 verdicts were passed by the jury courts. And that's what we see in the movie, the trial of Franz during that time period. So now we turn to our distinguished guest to further analyze the characters in Love It Was Not. Dr. Sudi Back received her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Georgia in 2004. She joined the MUSC faculty in 2005 and among her many other very uh, important clinical and teaching roles. She's currently a professor and director of the Drug Abuse Research Training, DART, programs at MUSC. Her primary research interests focus on the treatment of substance use disorders and co-occurring conditions such as PTSD. Dr. Olga Mincer is currently a tenured professor in psych psychiatry and College of Health Professions at MUSC. She earned her medical degree at the Hebrew University Hadassah Medical School in Jerusalem. Among her many research and clinical accomplishments, Dr. Mincer is a leading expert in mood and anxiety disorders with additional research interests in areas of cognition, dementia, and traumatic brain injury. So now I'm gonna turn the program over to Aaron Boyton, who will moderate. Please do remember to put any comments and questions you have in the chat and Aaron, uh, take it away. Thank you, Sandra. On behalf of the Remember program, we would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight and send a very special thank you to our panelists, Olga Minster and Sudi Black. As Sandra mentioned, throughout the conversation, if you have any questions, please send them into the chat and we'll be happy to answer them towards the end of the program. I'm gonna start us off with our first question um, to Sudi and to Olga of what themes in the movie intrigued you? you want me to? Take it away, Sidi. Okay, sure. <laughs> so, so first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, uh, I know many names here in, in uh, and faces that I see. Uh, Sudi and I are not only collaborators, co-workers, but also friends. It's the uh, second time that I managed to convince Sudi to participate in the Jewish Film Festival. Uh, that one was in person in the Terrace Theater. It was wonderful. So um, this is really a privilege to, to be able to do it with you, Sudi, again. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding, uh, regarding the, 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 the question, so, you know, for me, it was obviously extremely emotional. Um, on a personal level, my, my father was in Auschwitz. Um, so the offspring and child of Holocaust survivors was, was fascinating and difficult to watch. But I also have to put on my professional hat. And uh, while watching the movie the second time, because the first one was quite emotional, uh, the first thing that came to mind is, is, is a term that you may be familiar with. It's a term more used by media in popular culture, the Stockholm Syndrome. And um, it's not used as much in a professional uh, literature, but what the story was is that in the 70s, there was a robbery of a bank in Stockholm where I think four, uh, four uh, um, captives were taken by uh, hostages, by, uh, by the robbers and held for over 130 hours. It wasn't a very long period of time, but during that time and thereafter, there was a kinship and supportive relationship a positive relationship developed between uh, the, the hostages and their captors. And uh, it was a fascinating uh, a concept for people um, in, in a difficult concept to grasp uh, how can such a relationship develop. Um, since then, in more of the professional community, the idea of uh, trauma bonding as a, as a term uh, is something that we use more and it kind of, uh, encompasses a relationship between abuser and a victim and a hostage and a captor. Um, and uh, my first thought was, uh, is that type of uh, relationship that we are witnessing in, uh, in the movie? Um, you know, there are several ingredients uh, to uh, what constitutes trauma bonding on the underlying dynamic. And one of them, and we've discussed it with, with Sudi uh, um, uh, when we uh, 
discussed the movie was one is a power differential. It's not an even relationship. Uh, the other one is the intermittent nature of the interaction. So there, uh, there is a bad and good moments and that's a big reinforcer in, in, in our world and mental health professionals to continue a behavior. Uh, another element is um, what we call intense arousal, not in a positive way, but uh, mostly intense fear. And the last item that constitutes this kind of a dynamic is the issue of, uh, of, of bonding periods, because there are periods during this, what you call relationship, that the bonding between the captor or the abuser and the victim exists. So, so my question, to you, Sudi, as an expert in, in, in trauma, um, what do you think um, led or, or, or uh, Helena to, to develop this seemingly positive relationship with France while they were in the camp? Um, that's a good question. And I think there are a number of factors related to what you're speaking to, Olga, with the trauma bonding that we can hypothesize, you know, when we look at the circumstances, the situation that Helena was in, um, she was young also, and um, she was fearful for her life on a daily basis, literally not knowing where the next provision might come from or when, if ever, you know, she would, she would make it out of that situation. And so I can see how in, um, in those traumatic, you know, chronic traumatic events, um, the survival instinct can take over. Um, and so people, um, uh, you know, can be more likely to then pair with or bond with on a number of different levels, um, individuals in those situations who can help them survive in some way. And it's a little complicated um, because you know, we don't know, and she didn't know for sure if, if he would, if Franz would actually you know, um, help her and be kind to her. But we saw that, that he, he was, as she reported in the, in the trial at the end, she, she was good to him at times. And, um, and did give her some provisions as well as her friends, which was an interesting point. Now, you know, it's, it's unclear like what her true feelings really were, you know, in that situation. And I imagine that she could have experienced some cognitive dissonance there of, of not at all, you know, wanting to to be um, kind or gentle with her captors um, who were responsible for you know, the murder of her family members. And at the same time, that instinct to survive might have you know, muted some of the other feelings that she might've been feeling at that time. Yeah, this is a really interesting point. And in, in my thoughts go also to the environment in which they existed, you know, and, and, and uh, as a cap, as a, somebody who is, who, who is a prisoner in, in Auschwitz, I mean, this is a, a, a place of incredible uh, environmental deprivation, social uh, stimuli. I mean, it, it, it could not be, you know, and I have to bring when my father would describe it as, you know, Dante's Inferno. Um, so, so, so lack of stimulation, uh, you can th think about POWs. Uh, I mean, there was a negative stimulation, but nothing positive. I mean, they, they were trying to create some seemingness of, of, of normalcy with, with using culture or, or music or singing from time to time. Uh, you know, the German also, <laughs> mind you, were interested in, 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 in uh, observing it. Um, but this plays also a really big role in uh, maintaining that type of relationship, just an encapsulated, deprived environmental uh, situation they are in. So I think that there is another element that, that, that comes, uh, comes to mind 
Um, uh, so was it all only about self self preservation? Right. That's that's a curious question. You know, when we when we um, when we look at children, for example, um, who uh, are living in families in which they are chronically abused physically or sexually or emotionally, um, they may actually have positive feelings and love. Their family members, um, they're, they're in a similar role as Helena in that they are dependent, fully dependent on this other person. Um, as you mentioned before, Olga, the power differential is very real. Um, you know, children in abused homes, they have no power over their situation. They can't just leave whenever they want to, or they're not even safe to verbalize their true feelings or even show them sometimes. So they have to really, um, you know, get very good at kind of masking some of the things that they might actually feel for fear of, of being punished, being reprimanded. Um, but they may actually have feelings, of course, for those individuals that they spend time with, that they have bonded with um, and had some positive interactions, even if it's just a meal, to know that they would have a meal each day. You know, so this is really interesting because on the face of it, uh, she was not abused by friends. On the contrary, he was mm -hmm. the one who provided um, consolation when she was upset, provided goods and protection to her and her friends. But we cannot forget that she observed his cruelty. Mm -hmm. It was very, very clear and never forgotten, although he was always kind to her and mm -hmm. people in her closest circle, um, that he could be the abuser. I mean, I did, could not escape her because she observed his interactions with pr other prisoners, primarily male prisoners, uh, she saw him beating others. So there, I think that if, if someone were to say, well, no, look, it's not a typical abuser. He did not abuse Helena. It does not, I don't see yeah. it as such because as the power differential is very, very clear here, she observed there was no predictability in it. Yeah. There is no guarantee that, that his behavior or he may be tired of that relationship or whatever it is, as we said, mm -hmm. the powers absolutely was his. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting to me in a way, it, and she was also the one that was the victim of the persecution because of that relationship. Uh, it seemed that it could have been dangerous to him, but I think we had this discussion, really the, the danger to him as a result of that relationship were minuscule compared to, uh, if at all, um, compared to what, uh, what she could have endured, which is that. Uh, and, and clearly, uh, clearly torture. Uh, and so there was, it was always very clear. Um, so now the other variable that plays a role in it, in, 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 and I, it's, if I use it in quotation, it's, 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 it's a, you know, the, the, what it provided to Helena, it, there was a degree of lifestyle. I mean, she received not also being helped and, 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 and keep her from being killed. And, you know, the crematorium was just across <laughs> from their barracks from Canada. It, it, and, and, and this red sky was, uh, and, and, and everything, they were right there very close by. That was the imminent death was, 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 was there all the time. But there are, the abuser or, or, or the captor provides a certain lifestyle benefits. And obviously uh, those were very, very obvious and clear to, to Helena, correct? Yeah, and it's interesting too, um, Olga, hearing you talk about how he was physically abusive to others um, and also in her presence. And I wonder, you know, to some degree if that was, that was intentional in a bit, you know, to, to show her that he could, he could do these things. He does have that capacity. Um, and then when she was taken um, captive by 
um, some of the soldiers and, and held alone in isolation for several days. And she was beaten during those times, um, not directly by Franz, I believe, but indirectly through the other captors that were there as well. And yeah, and that imminent danger, that imminent threat of death and unpredictability, unpredictability, you know, surrounding every day. So this is a reinforcer, this kind of unpredictable yeah. situation that is, is, is a reinforcer of, of, of continuous behavior, of, of her continuing in, in that relationship possibly. Um, what about in this deprived environment, mm -hmm. uh, the need for intimacy on her part even? It is, there is an intimacy between the captor or the abuser and, 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 and the victim. Yeah. As pathological as it may be, the question is, was it? Uh, but there is, mm. is it, it, this is a fairly intimate, I mean, that relationship at some level is intimate relationship of sorts, isn't it? What do you think? I guess we would consider it a romantic, a romantic relationship, um, you know, irrespective of the level of actual intimacy that they have there. I think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, as well. And, you know, for humans, generally we need the most very basic of, of safety, of shelter, um, security, um, food, uh, those kinds of needs occur first before then moving on to, uh, to love or to, you know, bonding and even up to higher uh, levels on Maslow's hierarchy. So I do have, um, you know, my speculations around how, how true the feelings were um, that she had. And I also, you know, take note that in those kinds of contexts, it would be really difficult for her to think clearly, um, just given the trauma, given the lack of sleep, given the, the fear, you know, the fear arousal happening all the time, the grief. Um, it would be difficult to, to think um, clearly through that. And it's not like she could probably go and get consultation from um, other you know, family or friends who were there around it. And she was very young too. Um, so that's something to think about. We don't know if she had, if she had any romantic relationships prior to this. So, so if we go back, back again into the, the extremely skewed uh, 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 sen perceptions during really sensory, physical, and other deprivation that are critical yeah. uh, may explain behaviors that clearly later on she, she denied, it, oh. uh, she, she distanced herself very much from uh, yeah, yeah. Um, a, another thing that I, that I think maybe in plain, and we'll get probably if we have time to the question, was it love? Um, uh, is the issue of appeasement. I mean, uh, she was dealing, it was a fairly dangerous situation. You know, mm -hmm. people who are captors of victims uh, for survival need to, on an ongoing basis, to appease their. Uh, the, the the abuser or the captor or uh, in order to survive um, I think that you know although she had the breakdown points and again because it takes a toll you know with the de with depression with her with with when she was really breaking and he had to console her but it was on her to be the appeaser uh, in, in, in breaking away from that relationship when he is who is he's was the instigator of that relationship at the beginning mm -hmm. she at the beginning of that relationship uh says I, I didn't want to even look at him i mean how can i he is he is the devil incarnate um but once it begins once the interest is on you um uh, the need to continue appeasing for your own survival the abuser right is paramount for, 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 for you to, to, to go on, on, on and, 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 and not to be victimized in a case of, of abusive relationship again, 
or not to get there or to prevent the wrath of his anger that she that she had fairly good glimpses of. Yes, and in working with trauma survivors of various types of traumas, um, war crimes or, or sexual assault, um, I think of some of those in particular being prolonged. This is, this is not a one-time event that happens acutely, but prolonged with, with sometimes you don't know if there's an end in sight. Um, that can be a big part of their recovery as well, is thinking back and making sense of um, what they did or didn't do during those times and why, um, so that they can come to come to terms with it, come to peace, you know, with that as well. But, but you're right, what if she had decided to reject his um, you know, attempts to talk with her or attempts to um, see her or give her, but if she rejected anything that he sent her way, what would, what would have happened to her or her friends um, at that time? I don't know. So, you know, I, 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 we could probably continue talking about it, uh, just about, about Helena, and then we'll probably get back to her because the, the, the time after the war is, 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 is absolutely fascinating as well. But I'm curious, you know, and, and maybe not as popular uh, to, 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 to talk, but what about France? What's, yeah. What can we make of his state uh, to pursue that relationship? You know, at some point when we were talking to each other, we're just, a, you know, it's clearly there is a power differential. He has the absolute power in that relationship. Um, uh, but you know, what was he thinking? Uh, his his uh, personality structure. Are we talking up here about a narcissist? What, what what are we? Who, who what what is it in for hands? Uh, is it in that moment again a young man in his early? What was he? Probably wasn't what he was twenty twenty one or less. Uh, mm -hmm. um, maybe nineteen. Um, young, obviously. Uh, cast in that in in that in that environment, um, uh, uh, it, 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 he was not oblivious to the power, <laughs> clearly. Um, what was it for him, you think? Yeah, that's, um, that's also another you know, big question and theme um, from, the, from the relationship as well, is how did he really feel about her? Was he infatuated? with her? Um, was he truly in love with her? Uh, and asking those questions, given that he wanted to continue the relationship with her after the war had ended. He wrote these letters to try to reach her. He, um, oddly enough, uh, cut out her face and put it in a locket uh, with his face on the other side. Um, and then even more oddly, gave it to his daughter to have. So there were a number of questions about his, um, his functioning, his insight and um, narcissism, like the, the insensitivity, you know, of which he would, um, would do those things and even present that to, to his daughter as well. Watching the videos of him also um, was disturbing, uh, especially when he talked about how when he went into when he was reprimanded, um, when he was at the camp, was at the camp, he was taken in to see his higher ups because it had become, they had become aware that he was having this relationship, you know, with a prisoner. And um, the way he described when he walked in and the, the judge um, just winked at him about it, like to let him know you won't be in trouble for this or, he seemed to be very happy about that, but in a, in a strange and disturbing way um, for me. I mean, it, 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 it's not only, it's also this kind, it, when we see him throughout this whole period, you know, it, 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 this very entitled yes. approach. And an entitled approach then, uh, and, and, and throughout, uh, after the war, uh, um, yeah. and 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 uh, I think that also exhibited this kind of very authoritarian in terms of approach to 
to women around him. Yeah. Because yeah. towards her, but again, it was very clear this was a woman in, in the camp that could not react negatively to him. Uh, so the submissive, beautiful uh, woman uh, that mm. will not gonna reject him, that is not gonna negatively react to him. But thereafter, he's in his relationship, obviously with his wife and including with his daughter uh, and, mm. and, and seeing uh, nothing wrong with that. And throughout this, in, including in the interviews, I mean, uh, at some point I thought, is, is, is it oblivious? No, I mean, if we dig a little bit on a psychological basis, it's not being oblivious. <laughs> it's a very clear character structure. Clearly, you know, uh, it, it, his approach to looking at gender relationship, even with, you know, with, with, with post-war with his family, with his daughter, and with his wife, yeah. clearly yeah. the differential was, was ongoing. Um, right. the, 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 and maybe that was part of the attraction. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna interrupt you because we're gonna go. I hate to do this to you. I'm so sorry, but we're gonna go to some of the questions that are in the chats. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for this really intriguing and thoughtful discussion so far. Um, we have a question um, from Mary Glickman. She says um, her statement at the end of the film that her feelings were not love, but an infatuation is delivered with some defiance and some bitterness. And I didn't believe it. It's one of the saddest parts of the film for me. What do you both think of this part of the film? Uh, you know, it, we didn't have the opportunity to talk about uh, Helena's character and she didn't give us very much. Uh, she was very reserved and very restrained, but uh, uh, um, I, <laughs> There were elements of, you know, when we when we look, there was a, a theory uh, uh, that was created in the in the eighties about, you know, the the theory. It's called triangular theory of love of the elements of of of, of love and in in the interplay between them. And one is intimacy, you know, which is the emotional support and and, and caring. The other one is passion, which it could be the physical attachment, and 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 the 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 third. Uh, um, variable is, is commitment, the decision to stay with somebody and, and continue maintaining a relationship. And there are various interactions between these elements to create different types of love. Uh, one of them may be infatuation. That's where the, 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 maybe the degree of passion or the physical need or, 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 or need for intimacy plays. And maybe this variable was playing at that moment for her. It was very clear that thereafter, I think when you reevaluate and when she reevaluates um, in the context of being in Israel, when um, you know, clearly that was extremely negatively viewed by, by, by her surroundings, that relationship and she was hiding it. Um, when you reevaluate re that, uh, I think that it comes with, uh, with a feeling of, of the, the defiance uh, is, um, I may have, I had those elements, but no, it was not love. That continuous commitment um, was not there. Um, there was fear involved probably thereafter, again, growing and living in Israel. Um, uh, uh, in, in, in those early days uh, of, of the country, uh, even Holocaust survivors were viewed negatively. Uh, there was a term coined uh, for Holocaust survivors by the uh, people who, you know, the, 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 what we call Halutzin people who started the country who were not in World War II are referred to as Sabonim, which means uh, soaps. These were the name uh, for Holocaust survivors and these are for the victims. So could you imagine what it is in the, when you are a person that potentially may be perceived as collaborator, you know, with, with, or, 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 or with, with an oppressor. Um, and then some level that, that must have played into her, uh, into, her in, into the way she, she communicated after the war in the interviews. And, and, and uh, I'm curious, Sudi, what you think? I know that there are questions. Who was she? What was you know, her, her character? I, I, I don't really know. She held it very close. She was very confident. 
clearly she was very strong um uh and she was trying in a way to maybe in this comment to justify i had to do it in order to survive i know it's one of the most curious um you know and intriguing comments of the movie right of the love it was not um and it is said with some some hesitation or some defense around that um and so again it makes me you know wonder how she truly felt i also am wondering too given you know the the discrimination um and um you know, anti-semitism that was occurring could she have internalized some of that as well um and and you know, started to see herself in that way so that she wasn't going to um, be as assertive as maybe she wanted to be or, me, or she wasn't going to, um, to say things that she might have because she was, you know, questioning um, after living, you know, living in those situations or living in a culture where other groups are telling you that, you know, you're not, you're not good enough or you know, all these negative thoughts and labels can come and, and sometimes hearing those over and over again, people can start to adopt those labels. Correct. And, 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 and it, I think it's, you know, before we not go to the next question, it's really, please, it, it's very, very important to remember that she had PTSD most probably. I mean, we cannot, you know, we were always yeah. talking about as, 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 as mental health professional, we cannot diagnose without direct contact. But right. we hear from the, from, from the children, she has these rage attacks. We see that we see the behaviors uh, yeah. that are consistent with PTSD. So some of her reaction, including I think the defiance, uh, that appears as defiance, uh, maybe right. parts of, 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 of even, even some of the, that may be interpreted as irritability or in some ways, you know, uh, mm -hmm. she had PTSD. And so did um, many of the, of the women around that we did not talk about that her, 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 her uh, friends or the women that were giving uh, the testimonies as well. So uh, I think that this whole dynamic plays into her response, but she, I, I think it's pretty clear to me that, that she had PTSD. I would, yeah, I would agree that the rage and irritability is, is a big a symptom of PTSD. And oftentimes people are not able to sleep um, we do a lot of work with um, war veterans and you know, some will sleep two or three hours a night. You know, that is the most that they get. So their um, stress response system biologically is ramped up and never really given a chance to, to come down and rest. And so, yeah, I, I agree. Remember, and I think also the defiance I want to mention is remember that there was a very, very intimate and difficult relationship between her and her sister. Yeah. Uh, yeah. her sister resent ongoing resentment towards her by allowing her to leave and 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 her children being sacrificed. And uh, so it, it it continues throughout post-war era, and the relationship is very fraught between them. So again, it may create the this defiant stand that you you know ab about the relationship with friends later on, uh, although uh, in, in a, and maybe leads to a certain degree to her need to go and speak at the, at the trial uh, mm. and say all of, the, all, all of those things. Uh, I don't know if it was some kind of a, to some degree, a cathartic event for her um, yeah. to, to, to say it all, the good right. and the bad. Right, that might have been healing in some ways for her. Right. I'm going to go to our next question. Um, and let's see, this is from Ava Kleinman. Um, and she says, what do you think of the popularization of these kinds of relationships, um, especially as, um, as seen in, in this movie, but also in the book, The Nightingale? I'm not sure if um, either of you are familiar with that book, or um, I'm probably going to pronounce this correctly, um, Sweet Francaise. I speak Spanish, not French, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so what do we think of the romanticization and popularization of these types of relationships um, as portrayed in popular film and books? You know, that, 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 that's too, as they say in the media, up to Hollywood to decide, but, uh, but this is, it, it, these relationships are extremely fascinating. They're obviously uh, very interesting and uh, for us to, 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 de to delve into and, and, and watch and read about much more than, you know, uh, uh, two wonderful young people meet, you know, have a very healthy, loving relationship and, and you know, and live happily ever after. Um, those are, re I mean, those type of relationship, including the so-called, you know, Stockholm Syndrome-like or, or the bonds uh, of these natures are not very prevalent, you know. So we are not talking here about uh, a very common occurrence uh, and, and, and they are in really con conducted in my mind in a pathological setting. These are not, yeah. it, we could talk about abuse if we have about control. Um, why would, uh, I, I, I think that is it some kind of a voyeuristic nature of, on, on our part as, as outsiders to, 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 to be fascinated by those? Um, is an open question in my mind. What do you think, Sudi? Um, it's um, it, then we go into this kind of a social psychology mm -hmm. uh, about uh, about you know the bystander who stands and watches something that occurs on the on the other side of the street. Uh, I mean, and the fascination when we slow down in traffic mm -hmm. when there is an accident. Is that that? Well, with a with a movie like this, you know, I wonder if there are any potential harms of a movie like this, you know, does it, does it, um, was it even worse, way worse than what the movie made it out to be, you know, the lived experience. And so, you know, I wonder if it, if it adds a bit of romance, it romanticizes those situations in a way that isn't, um, isn't real. It, could that be harmful, you know, in some ways? Yeah, and, and, and that's a really good point. And I want, you know, we were talking and, 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 and Sandra, I don't know if I may get you uh, into the discussion, you know, uh, as also a child of Holocaust survivors, what would your parents say about this movie and this relationship? Well, I don't think my parents would have had any patience for this movie at all for exactly that reason, that it was so, um, unusual of a situation and you know going back to Maslow my mother her experience was just not having enough to eat throughout the war and to have the occasional person that was in Canada and had a support like that to feed her I think she would have just thought why does somebody make a movie like that so I don't think she would have had any patience for the movie at all and I'm basing this on other things that we would see, you know, when she would have, she, because her experience was so horrible and there were so few people that were kind to her. The other thing is my mother never, didn't talk about the Holocaust a lot. All those women in that movie reminded me of my mother because, um, you know, they sort of matter of factly talked about what their experience was. But my mother, the one thing she did talk about when we were growing up was how her mother didn't, or her sister did not survive the war. She was with her sister for the whole war and then her sister died of typhus at the end of the war. And that was something she could never forgive herself for. So to see that that woman's, that, that Helena's sister was able to survive, I think that my mother just would have been so angry that that could have occurred when her mother, when her sister died. But so you might ask, why did I want to show the movie if I think that my mother had re reacted that way? And I also feel that Hollywood does tend to romanticize the Holocaust too much just so it's palatable to people. But I felt that it also brought the theme of the, that, you know, the way the uh, inmates were to each other just to survive. At the very beginning of the movie, they talk about how they had to blow up the buildings at Auschwitz and how the Germans would make them stand there while the buildings were falling down so that the people that were at the front of the line would be killed, the inmates at the 
that they were near the building would be killed and how they would push their best friends into the front row so that they would save themselves. And uh, my mother talked about that too, how horrible the you know, inmates were to each other. So I heard those stories more than I did about the good Germans, but I thought that this film really talked about all those issues in addition to the, you know, the voyeuristic but interesting relationship that uh, Helena and Franz had. So I thought that it was a very complex movie. I thought there was a lot of history that you got from the movie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you saw how the Germans just assumed they were right and that continued after the war. They, Franz, you know, he never thought he did anything wrong. So he was, why, you know, why wouldn't Helena come to him? Because he was a good guy and the Germans just felt they were good guys. They were just doing what they had to do. So although I think my mother would have had no patience for that movie, I thought it was complex on many levels, which uh, resonated with me. Karen, are there any more questions? Oh, <clears throat> not right now. Um, and I just want to thank you both so much for your insight into this movie tonight. And I am going to pass it over to Samantha Krantz, um, who is a member program associate at the Charleston Jewish Federation. I wanted to thank you all for joining us tonight and joining the Charleston Jewish Film Fest, the Charleston Jewish Federation's Remember Program, the Oshik Arnold Jewish Studies Program, and the Charleston County Library for a special discussion on Love It Was Not with Dr. Olga Mincer and Dr. Sudi Back. We greatly appreciate Dr. Mincer and Dr. Back for joining us tonight and sharing their expertise on this topic. Please join us as we continue to commemorate Yom HaShoah as a community-wide event on April 11th at 4 o'clock p.m. via Zoom for Charleston's 2021 Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Program. The keynote speaker is Holocaust survivor Hersher Greenblatt. We will convene as a community to honor our local survivors and their descendants, remember those we lost in the Holocaust, and commit to preserving their critical legacy. We must remember our past to build a better future, and together we will keep the memory of those senselessly murdered in the Holocaust alive. You can register at tinyurl.com slash rememberCharleston. Additionally, please save the date for the Charleston County Public Library to join them on May 11th for a conversation with author, journalist, and filmmaker Howard Reich. They will discuss his book, The Art of Inventing Hope, and Intimate Conversations with Ellie Wazell. Thank you again, and we hope you have a great night. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Thank everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me Thank tonight. You. Thank you. Thank you for joining the program to all the participants. <laughs>